Hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be able to give this talk, and we will give it in a combined manner, uh, myself and uh, Dennis Vert. And uh, we're very happy to thank our wonderful collaborators on this project, uh, Sadra, Jazairi, Shi Tong, and Yu Hongsu. And the corresponding paper uh, was out uh, this summer. So we will um, tackle the question of parity violation of interest in this workshop from the angle of inflation. So let me remind you that um, inflation literally acts uh, as a giant microscope. Inflation takes a tiny patch of space and stretches it to become the entire observable universe. And in this process, uh, unavoidable quantum fluctuations get stretched to cosmological scales to provide the seeds of all the structures we see in the universe. And so for a primordial cosmologist, any observation of the cosmic microwave background, the Laska structure or gravitational waves, give us a probe more or less convoluted of the statistical properties uh, of the fluctuations left over after uh, the end of inflation. And um, the job of primordial cosmologists is to try to make the link between these statistical properties and the unknown physics of inflation that may operate at very high energy. And so when you have in mind this picture of inflation as a giant microscope, uh, parity violation on cosmological scales is a pretty much uh, conservative uh, expectation because we know that parity is not a symmetry of our microscopic world. Uh, we know that the electric sector breaks parity. And therefore, um, the fact that this can be imprinted on cosmological scales uh, is something really worth in investigating. And uh, as people know well in this workshop, in the last years, uh, there have been um, many studies and hints about parity violation in cosmology, uh, in the CMB birefringence, and also in uh, the BOSS uh, Lotzka structure data, although uh, this may be due to systematics. So um, there are two types of relics uh, of inflation, uh, gravitational waves and density fluctuations. For gravitational waves, uh, the two different helicity may have distinct properties, and this parity violation may be judged at the level of the two-point function of graviton, so the tensor power spectrum. For density fluctuations, situation is more complicated, and the first sign of parity violation is at the level of the four-point function. So this is uh, now well known, but let me give you the, the main idea. Um, for two-point and three-point kinematics, um, the mirror image of this uh, kinematic is related to, to the original one by uh, rotation, and therefore because of um, um, statistical uh, isotropy, the corresponding uh, signal is zero. Uh, however, if you go to the four-point function, and uh, then if you look at generic configuration of the tetrahedron um, generated by the four corresponding wave vectors, uh, in general, this is non-planar, and therefore uh, there is no such simplification, and you can have a parity violation. This actually corresponds to uh, the imaginary part of the four-point function. This can be uh, easily understood. Uh, this is the difference between a, a given world and a given uh, uh, world uh, seen through a mirror. And when you do such a uh, parity transformation, x goes to minus x, the wave vector k goes to minus k. Okay, so you look at this, that, that difference, that's really um, the signal of parity violation. And for a real field, such as, let's say, well, temperature fluctuations or galaxy over density, um, let, let's call it O, uh, O of minus k is actually O of k dagger. And actually, this is nothing other than proportional to indeed the imaginary part of the four point function. So this is really the object that we will consider um, throughout the talk, uh, the uh, parity odd part of the connected four-point function or the so-called primordial trispector. So now, uh, what's, what is the language uh, that we will use? Well, most economical language to discuss the genesis of primordial fluctuations is the one of uh, the effective field theory of inflationary fluctuations. In, in this language, one forgets about the question of what is the mechanism actually generating the phase of inflation, but one rather concentrates on formulating theories uh, straight at the level of fluctuations. So you basically describe inflation as a phenomenon of spontaneous symmetry breaking. You have a clock during inflation that tells you when you are during inflation and when inflation ends. And because of that um, spontaneous breaking of time translation invariance, uh, we know that there necessarily exists um, a Goldstone boson associated with that. 
uh, that is called pi here. And um, in a suitable range of energies, it is enough to concentrate on that Goldstone boson. You can think of it as a kind of nonlinear generalization of uh, delta phi if you want in single field inflation. And uh, it's straightforwardly related to what we care observationally, the curvature perturbation zeta. So it's a good language, it's model independent, it makes symmetries manifest, direct link with observations. And to give you an idea of the kind of uh, symmetry that this makes manifest, if you look at the simplest deviation from single field thermal inflation, that corresponds in that language to uh, having a, a propagation speed of the Gaussian boson pi CS, which is uh, which is not one, which is reduced, and um, actually through the realization, the nonlinear realization of time diffeomorphism invariance, as soon as you have this a non a reduced speed of sound, you necessarily have a large quartic interactions. And um, and this generates, for in that case, a large parity even, in that case, four-point function whose size is fixed by the speed of sound. And in this case, uh, it is of order one over CS to the four. So now with this language, you may uh, ask, okay, how to generate large uh, priority of four-point function? That's, rather, that's probably rather easy. You just uh, invoke uh, parity violating interactions, cubic or quartic interactions. Uh, typically with a bunch of epsilon ijk tensors, and this will generate the parity odd uh, four-point function you're looking for. But actually, this is not as easy. It has been shown in these two papers that under um, a certain set of uh, very conservative and reasonable assumptions, uh, the signal is literally zero. So the, the assumptions are scale invariance, branch Davis vacuum, and a linear dispersion relation, like the speed of sound that I've mentioned. And so in that case, Whatever the interaction, the signal is always literally zero. And so uh, you see really how it's exciting because it means that if we ever detect parity uh, violation of level of density fluctuations, and this really, and whether you can really say it comes from primordial origin, then this will be super exciting for inflation because this will be a clear smoking gun of something different from the vanilla single field EFT of inflation. And so the implication of that and what we did about that will be described next. Uh, by Dennis. Thank you. One simple and motivated way to bypass the no-go theorem is to invoke some additional field content during inflation that couples to the visible sector, uh, to the Golson boson of broken time translations. And such extension is particularly motivated from high energy physics. And so in this work, we consider the following action. We have a PROCA theory coupled to an FF dual uh, coupling where kappa in blue here is the chemical potential. So being a spin one massive particle, this field has three degrees of freedom, one longitudinal mode, which is irrelevant for parity violation, and two transverse mode uh, that leads to parity violation because these two modes exhibit different, a distinct power due to the chemical potential. And so from an effective field theory of fluctuations point of view, the chemical potential can be seen as a direct consequence of broken time diffeomorphism invariance by the background inflaton field. And so essentially, by exchanging transverse modes of this particle, we uh, can obtain parity violating four-point function in the scalar sector, shown here uh, with this diagram. However, the amplitude of the corresponding parity odd signal uh, from the exchange of a massive field is generically suppressed. For example, it is either mass suppressed or exponentially suppressed. This exponential here being associated to the particle creation rate. But actually, uh, something quite remarkable happens when the Golston boson pi has a reduced speed of sound. So first, uh, the amplitude of the signal can be large. It is no longer exponentially suppressed as the dimensionless parameter CS times the mass in Hubble unit uh, can be smaller than unity. And second, uh, the massive field can be integrated out, albeit in a non-local manner. And this can be readily understood at the level of the equation of motion for the massive field, coupled to some general source, which is quadrat quadratic here, uh, in our case, in the field pi for the four-point function. So essentially, uh, time derivatives in red or of uh, order Hubble, but the special gradient in blue, thinking in Fourier space or of order k squared, where k is the momentum flowing in the exchange uh, process. And now, uh, because pi has a reduced sound speed, the term in blue scales at, as uh, h squared over c squared, which dominates over the other term. 
So we can therefore safely neglect the red term and inverse only the special operator uh, to obtain the sigma field. Here we say we have integrated out this field by setting it on shell. And notably, uh, the diagram we obtain becomes contact, so easier to compute. And remember, uh, parity violation is hidden in this differential operator, D, um, which depends on kappa here, the chemical potential. But how to compute the parity violating signal? So let me quickly sketch the computation. Uh, to compute the signal, we need to integrate over time from the far past to the end of inflation. And the integrand is composed of uh, source terms, quadratic in the fields for the four-point functions here, and the non-local differential operator, D minus one, which crucially contains a pole in the complex tau plane. plane. So now, uh, after performing a weak rotation, which is the usual procedure to compute these kind of integrals, we hit the pole so that the integral is simply the residue of the integrand at this pole. So that means that the parity violating signal is entirely fixed by the singularity structure of the non-local operator and actually the mergers as a residue. This is why we talk about parity violations, uh, parity violation as a residue. And so this way we obtain a parity violating signal. Which, is, uh, ha which has three characteristics. First, a large amplitude in green, a polarization factor in blue uh, that does not vanish for non-planar configurations, and a dynamical shape function in red composed of just elementary functions. Here, in our case, uh, just rational functions or exponential, exponentials. And this is very convenient for data analysis. And importantly, uh, even though the theory is effectively single field, remember we have integrated out the heavy field, the Nogo theorem is bypassed here because the Im implicit assumption of locality is violated. And so in the previous template, uh, the dynamical shape function encodes a lot of interesting physics. So imagine in Fourier space, the kinematic configuration for the four point function uh, is a tetrahedron. And so let us fix an angle uh, so that it is non-planar. And so on this plot, we show the parity violating signal as a function of the internal momentum from regular configurations on the left to internally collapsed configurations on the right. And so the dotted line is the numerical result in the full uh, two-field theory without integrating out the heavy field. And the solid line is the non-local EFT result. So first, it's quite beautiful to see that we have a qualitatively good match between both signals, which means that the non-local EFT catches the essence and the main feature of the signal. And here I want to highlight three main features on this plot. So first, we have a large signal, promising for future observations. Uh, second, we have a new oscillating signal that is periodic in the momentum ratio, uh, which is quite new. Uh, whose frequency is set by the sound speed and the chemical potential. This is uh, drastically different from the usual cosmological collider signal, for example. And lastly, we have uh, in blue a low speed collider signal or some sort of resonance uh, who whose position enables to reconstruct the mass of the spin one field and the speed of sound of the Colson boson. But actually, uh, let me emphasize that this last signal is way more general than just for parity violating signals. So very generically, whenever the Golson boson has a reduced sound speed, a distinctive resonance uh, can be visible in the mildly soft kinematic configurations of cosmological correlators. And this signal typically reveals the presence of an additional massive particle. Uh, so for uh, illustrative purposes here um, on this plot, I showed the bispectrum shape for, uh, from equilateral triangles on the left to squeeze triangles on the right in the momentum ratio. And so on the left panel, a small sound speed generates large equilateral number changes. This has been known for a long time now. On the right plot, the presence of an additional particle can be measured via the so-called uh, cosmological collider signal in ultra-squeezed configurations. But quite remarkably, in between, we have a resonance. And this low speed collider signal can be understood and explained by a non-local single field EFT, where precisely the massive field is integrated out, but in a non-local manner. And so intuitively, it boils down to replace uh, the Feynman propagator in the computation of these integrals in position space uh, by a Dirac uh, function in time, which basically means uh, instantaneous propagation and uh, a Yukawa potential, uh, which is some kind of a mild non-locality in space. 
And if you want to know more, uh, check out these two uh, papers on the bottom right um, of, the, of the slide. And so this uh, brings me to my conclusion. Uh, so first, uh, parity violation provides an interesting uh, detection channel uh, for uncovering new inflationary physics. Uh, we have explicitly computed the parity violating signal coming from the exchange of a massive spin one field with a chemical potential and have shown that the theory can be well understood with a non-local single field EFT. Uh, so essentially computing just simple diagrams, contact diagrams. Uh, we have shown that the parity violating signal can be large uh, we have also uh, we have a new and simple template for data analysis. Check out the paper, and uh, we have found a new class of oscillating signals uh, that are interesting on their own. And with that, I thank you for your attention uh, from Paris.